Hey there! By the way, I've been meaning to point this out. Welcome, by the way, to the Gracious Guest Show. Um, my gracious gang, this is the show where we are living with wonder and awe. And so anything that uh, is a portal into experiences of wonder and awe, we are going to take a look at that on this show. So uh, a couple quick things. First of all, that intro... That new, uh, those new title cards that you saw if you're watching the video. Isn't that awesome? That's just something I played around with a few days ago. I really wanted to get down something that matched the, the branding, so to speak, of the Gracious Guest a little bit better. So, I'm liking it. Um, burning a, uh, quart of candle back here from my friend Anna, who I interviewed a while back on her wonderful candles. Make sure to go to corda.com. Um, no paid promotion here. I'm just doing it because I think they're awesome and we can't get enough of them. So, Go to Corda.com, check out her candles. Uh, also, uh, I don't even know where my wife got this, quite frankly, but I'm going to find out because new Star Wars mug. Choose wisely, right? Light side, everybody. Be a, be a rebel against the evil, evil empire. No darkness around here. Which brings me to today's show. We're revisiting once again, and I will never get sick of revisiting it, the C.S. Lewis Trilogy the so-called Space Trilogy, which Lewis himself, we've pointed out before, probably would have hated it being called the Space Trilogy because, as he loves to point out in the stories, he's talking about the heavens, not space. You know, it's, it's uh, brimming with all sorts of divine activity. Um, and so we're revisiting the Space Trilogy, the Ransom Trilogy, with a new acquaintance and friend, Miss Christiana Hale, whose book, Deeper Heaven... A Reader's Guide to C.S. Lewis's Ransom Trilogy came across my, or came into my attention a few weeks ago, a few months ago after uh, Bill Donahue and I had, had done the show, just sort of exploring what we really love about the Ransom Trilogy. And so a wonderful book by Christiana. She was uh, gracious enough to join me all the way from Idaho through a Zoom meeting here. Uh, I think you're really going to love it. And please, guys, as always, subscribe to the Gracious Guest channel right down here. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. If you have not clicked the like button yet, that's that little thumbs up, click it. Click it. Just, just go down and like it. Just like it. That does something on YouTube that's magic and that makes more people see this video. Um, subscribe to the channel if I didn't mention that. I know I did. I just did a second ago. So thank you guys so much, though, uh, for stopping by. Uh, I, I know you're going to love this interview, and uh, let's just get right to it now. My interview on Deeper Heaven, C.S. Lewis's Deeper Heaven with Christiana Hale. Check it out. Okay, Christiana Hale, thank you so much for coming on the Gracious Guest Show. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And and I um, let me just sort of you know fanboy here for just a second because <laughs> what what happened was as, as viewers of the uh, this show or listeners to the show because I do the video and the podcast version of it are probably obnoxiously aware of at this point. I just uh, uh, I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm a huge C.S. Lewis fan enthusiast. I mean, he's outside of the Bible. Uh, he's his writings have probably. Uh, affected my my life, my spiritual life, my imagination more than anyone else's writings. Yeah. And I know I'm not alone in that. And so I was doing an episode a few months back um, of kind of revisiting again. And it, it didn't really have a specific focus, but a friend, Bill Donahue and I, he, he's another teacher I've had on this program before. Uh, we decided to just do a quick little sit down and just share our experiences of the Ransom Trilogy because we had been texting each other and he he would forget, like it was over a few months, he'd be like, I forget, like, have you read the, have you read like the Ransom Trilogy? I'm like, yeah, and he's like, oh, right, you know, and so we finally just like, let's talk about it, and it was like, I kid you not, like a week after we did that show, or within that next week, so it was really like fresh in my mind, I just done another reread through all of them, that I was like, man, I'd love it if there's like a book that kind of captures something about the writing of it, or more, and your book popped right up, and it had just been published like when did you publish it again? Uh, it came out January, January. Okay. I mean, we we announced it in December, but we there gotcha. were some we hit some snags, so it was January. So that was yeah. It was just maybe it was only a few weeks after you published it. So I was I was there not from the very beginning, but pretty close. Yeah. So anyways, but I just wanted to share that it was just kind of a funny backstory. That's great. But yeah. <laughs> I wanted to ask you like for your background bio, just a little bit like what do you just whatever you'd want to share about kind of who are you and where are you coming from. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, so I, I grew up in North Idaho, which is where I actually still live. I'm a, a couple hours away from where I grew up originally, but, um, and I, 
I mainly grew up as far as C.S. Lewis with the, the Narnia stories, as most mm-hmm. uh, most people do. I was homeschooled all the way K through twelve. Um, my mother is is very patient, <laughs> and so uh, she she uh, homeschooled my sisters and I all the way through. And um, so she, uh, my first memories of Narnia are you know her sitting on the floor between my sister's bed and my bed and reading us uh, Narnia stories before bed. So, and I just, I always loved Narnia growing up. And then sure. it, was, it wasn't until high school that my mother discovered um, classical Christian education. And so mm-hmm. it was really only my junior and senior year that we kind of started um, going that direction with, uh, with my education. And in that, in the course of doing that, I ended up discovering more of Lewis's works, particularly, um, his kind of his, um, apologetic works. So sure. mere Christianity. And, um, I also read till we have faces, which yeah. was, was a struggle for me, but I, I remember reading it and saying, thinking, I have no idea what's going on, but I like it. <laughs> That one, I, I really, yeah. that one is amazing. I love that book and I had no clue why it was one of those. Can, and that actually, can I preemptively was, put you on the spot oh, and ask yeah, you to come back yeah. some other time just to talk about that? I'd love to. I okay. actually, <laughs> that's one book that I would love to yes. explore more about and study more. And, and I just, I, I really think it's quite something. And obviously uh, as I went on to, I went to a, um, classical Christian liberal arts college, New St. Andrews College, Mm -hmm. um, for my undergrad and my master's degree. And that was really, uh, I credit that book, Till We Have Faces, with pushing me to want to pursue classical education, because I only had a little taste of it in my junior, senior year of high school. And that book, I, I I realized there are a lot of things here that I just don't understand because I haven't had that background in the classics and I wanted to understand I wanted to be able to join in that conversation and um, be able to you know when someone says Plato I not only know who he is but I've actually read some of what he's written you know that sort of thing and um, so I went on to to do my um, bachelor's in liberal arts and culture at New St. Andrews College went on to do my master's uh, degree there as well in language and literature and okay. in the course of that I actually didn't read the Ransom Trilogy until my freshman year of college I had a rhetoric professor who's a big fan and he assigned it as okay. reading and so I had I had tried to read it much earlier when I was probably 14 or 15 and I actually sure. gave up because I didn't oh, okay. really I didn't really get it into it. The time I, for it. <laughs> it just wasn't the right time. I don't know. I was probably thinking, oh, this is, you know, he wrote Narnia. This is gonna be an adventure like, story. Right? It's gonna be yeah. sci-fi, it's gonna be great. And it just wasn't what I was expecting as a 14 year old. <laughs> and sure. so I did, ended did up, he give you just the uh, out of the silent planet or the whole like no, the whole he gave trilogy? us the whole trilogy. The okay. whole trilogy, and so yeah. I remember thinking when he assigned it, oh, I have to read it now. I have to push through because he assigned it, and there's currency, and like we have to, we have a quiz on it, so I have to read it. <laughs> and looking back, though, obviously, I'm very grateful that he made us read it because um, I just, I really fell in love with that with that series in particular. And I remember thinking when I finished that his strength, sitting there kind of stunned, and just thinking. I want to do my thesis on this series. Wow. I don't know what I'm going to say. I have no clue what I'm going to say, but so that was like that happened it. in in your class. Like you kind of hit that. Yeah. Like that realization. Yeah. Freshman wow. year, freshman year. I was like, I have, and also oh, really? it was a really, it was a really good timing because I, I was wow. very, very homesick. I hadn't been away from home before. I was homesick. I was, mm-hmm. it was a lot of work. It's a very rigorous program, and I was kind of feeling overwhelmed. And I remember honestly yeah. a couple times being like, I don't know if I can make it four years, and. I, that book though, that book, when I thought that I was like, well, I have to make it four years because I have to write my senior thesis about this series. So, you know, that, that kind of was always at the front of my mind. I I contemplated other topics for my thesis throughout the four years, but that always was on my list of, of things was, um, C.S. Lewis's, as most people call it space trilogy. And, and so I got to my senior year and, it was, a, there was a, there's a very whole, very funny story with figuring out actually what I was going to do my thesis on. There was, you know, a little bit of, I, I kind of tricked my advisor, not, not, not consciously. I used the word metaphysics in my 
my like thesis statement uh -huh. to my advisor and he's a philosophy professor so he was all over that he's like yes metaphysics <laughs> and then he gave me this book called like the metaphysics of dante's divine comedy and i got about two pages in and said no i'm not writing a philosophy <laughs> thesis <laughs> i'm not writing a philosophy thesis That's and so I met with him, we hashed it out, and, and he basically said, well, I don't really know too much about Lewis and the Ransom Trilogy, but I'll play devil's advocate all you want, so go for it, you know, and it ended up being really a really fun, fun experience. So that thesis was really, I would say, the, the seed of this sure. book. There are a lot of things that, that remain from that thesis, but it was a little bit more narrow, it was more argumentative. It was basically, right. I was making a direct comparison between the trilogy and Dante's Divine Comedy, right? Exactly, and yeah. and which does come out in my book. I, I did pull those threads in and, and make those allusions, but it was a little bit tighter and a particular point that I was trying to make. Um, but that yeah. was just so that was kind of the the thing that got me going. And then I went yeah. into my ma master's pro the master's program, and obviously then I'm facing a master's thesis, which is a bigger project. And yeah. that was that was the rough draft of Deeper Heaven. So I, I told okay. my advisor that I would really wanted to write. A, a reader guide because in the course of my research for my undergraduate thesis, I realized there wasn't really a whole lot out there. I mean, there, there are some really great books on it, right. but there wasn't a really handy thing that I could point some of my friends to that were asking me, why are you writing on this series? It's a yeah, really it weird like, <laughs> book. Right. And almost like an and, invitation to, because one thing I really like about, and by the way, just for anyone watching, and then I'll have all the links, of course, here is Here's the print copy of Deeper Heaven. Um, and then this is what the Kindle, I'm sorry, that's just dumb, <laughs> but it's, this is a Kindle. It's on Kindle. <laughs> so you can get, you can get, there's lots of books in there. Um, but yeah, and, and then I do, I always show this because I don't know which which version or versions you have. I like this one because it's all in one, but it's a little yeah, hefty to that's... be taking around with you. But um, but this, um, truth be told, I mean, I, I've, I've read through it so many times. I, I, I you know, and you know how like the story just sticks, you know, and these, it's almost like, I mean, I don't remember every single detail all the time, but I remember it better than probably anything I've ever read. And one of the reasons for me, at least that that is, and this is another thing from the notes below is the audiobooks. And um, I know there's sometimes people have different stances on this. I had someone tell me that it doesn't count that I've read them because I had them read to me. I'm like, so what you're saying is that everyone who knew the Iliad and the Odyssey front and back but couldn't read it that didn't count like excuse yeah. me no it audiobooks it count. does it does and but for me like I would listen to them a lot when I was driving and stuff and especially when I was in a lot of my uh, army training like all over the place when I was like in my mid-20s and so I've probably read slash audiobooked them probably at least a half dozen times now at this point and for those of you who I mean can see this again that's a pretty significant <laughs> amount of pages quite frankly yeah. it's it's a <laughs> There's lots of longer books, of course, but longer doesn't necessarily mean better, as we all know. And so uh, that would just be my little pitch as far as just some of the notes, uh, links and stuff below to make sure you check out if you want to um, get uh, Christiana's book. Or I also linked some others like Dr. Michael Ward's book, because um, yes. I know you, you, you mentioned that and I've, it's come up before on some of my previous shows and stuff. But, um, but why don't I just maybe turn it this direction, just ask you, this is just one piece of um well i'll tell you what let me do one thing before that can you maybe just just short little synopsis as far as like what you, you already kind of hinted at uh, as far as like a, a reader's guide for this this series by lewis so what is if you had to kind of summarize the overall um purpose of it maybe is, is, is a word i could use or just yeah. just your hope for the text itself that you that you have out there yeah so obviously the the text uh my book the kind of purpose is a little bit dual dual purpose twofold first obviously is to um hopefully give some give people tools with which they can then go read the series with kind of a better understanding of what lewis himself was trying to accomplish with it i do think a lot of people miss it especially the the medieval cosmology side of things because and, and what's funny is the kind of the reception especially among people who you know haven't haven't studied lewis they haven't gone to college to study lewis which is fine um that's not who he was writing for um but they don't have that context of the medieval cosmology which i don't think you necessarily need in order to enjoy 
enjoy the books. But I do think if you're confused about the books or you're not enjoying them, understanding where Lewis was coming from can help you to realize, oh, this is a lot more complex and cohesive than it might appear at first. Same thing with, um, it's, it's kind of with Dr. Ward's uh, Planet Narnia, how, what that did for, sure. for Narnia was to make you realize, oh, these aren't just, I mean, they are simple children's stories that are very enjoyable, right. but what makes them so timeless and what makes them hold together when there's all these things that are so strange in them like father what's father right. christmas in the line the witch in the wardrobe what what is they're, that they're about like, they're and, like cheesecake not a you know, cupcake like they're they're delicious exactly. but they're incredibly yeah. like there's a lot there you know yeah. yeah and and i i'm definitely i don't necessarily think that my book is quite meant to be at the same place as Planet Narnia. His his book is, is excellent. He was kind of groundbreaking research there. Um, mine's, I'm aiming at people, kind of the lay person, if, if you sure. will, you know, the person yeah. who's who's picked up the books or loves Lewis and hasn't really dared to approach the space trilogy yet or has tried right. or, you know, and just doesn't really get what's going on in there. So I'm trying sure. to give the tools, the background and, um, hopefully introduce some of that, the medieval literature that Lewis was greatly influenced by and loved. He was himself a professor of medieval literature. So he's clearly, uh, clearly loves that and is very influenced by that himself. And so to kind of give an introduction to those sorts of things that really hold the trilogy together and make it as amazing as I think it is. Yeah. And obviously beyond that to then point people to the, the things that Lewis himself was trying to point people to with his trilogy. So to continue kind of basically deepening the grooves that Lewis was, was already uh, making with his book, which, is, which are things that I think are applicable in our own lives and as yeah. we interact with the world around us, um, that these aren't things that are, you know, they're fun. It's a fun fantasy book, but they don't have any application. I think all of Lewis's fiction has great application without being Agreed. didactic, <laughs> which is why he's yeah. so great. I think that's yeah. what makes literature truly, uh, truly timeless and really, yeah. uh, really effective is that you learn things even when you don't really realize it, even if it's subconscious, there's all sorts of things there to learn. It's, it's so true. Cause, and I'm just laughing because I, my notes are all out of, or all, I've been recording a lot of things sort of out of order lately, like different shows. And what I was going to do this episode just just because I was thinking about us and I wanted to get kind of get the gears turning so like a week or so ago I did one called why you must read C.S. Lewis and just my perspective on that I did like a top five thing and um you certainly feel free to dispute these or, or add to them or anything we don't have to talk ab about this specifically but um right now but I said they were they're entertaining and fun and I was like putting all of it together like even the, the yeah. darker stuff sometimes but I said entertaining and fun superbly written like just the 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 um the, you know, the style, the, the trade craft of, of him just as a writer. Uh, but then the third one I had down was timeless and evergreen themes, mm -hmm. because I know that's what I always run into with it. Um, then of course, theologically and philosophically profound and that it prompts further digging, discussion, mulling, etc. cetera. Um, and so with, with some of those things in mind, let me just ask you like just one, one little piece, I guess it, it really underlies your whole book, I think, but um, what would you say the maybe the significance for you certainly Lewis's kind of notion of this true myth thing really would be this idea of because I know that the, the quote that's often quoted from him where he said about you know those who specifically would just dismiss Christianity as just a, a myth haven't read many myths mm -hmm. you know and and his mastery of what myth really is um and maybe just that in light of then the the ransom trilogy specifically. Um, so I don't know if that's too much to ask, but just I maybe in general, what do you think he means by true myth? Those who might not be familiar with that phrase, who just automatically assume myth means not true. Yeah, know? yeah, and I think I mean it's it's important because you know a lot of times again words words are important, and so when we say myth, you know, often oftentimes we will just use that to dismiss something as automatically a falsehood oh that's just a myth meaning right. it's it's not actually grounded in fact you know kind of in the realm of old wives tales or things like that right oh that's just that's just myth but Spray when Windex you but it, we also <laughs> yeah yeah exactly we also do use the word though to mean we could maybe 
call it more legend, like might be a better, mm-hmm. you know, led myth and sure. legend, you know, sometimes those things are said together. Um, and I think what Lewis means by myth more than anything is those, those stories that are so deeply rooted in um, type, typology, and basically that you can find across throughout history and across many different cultures, these sorts of themes and tropes and types that come up again and again, and that were very attractive to him even before he was converted, um, right. he that was you know one of those crucial discussions that he and and Tolkien and some of his other friends had was about the fact that he found these myths as he classified them so attractive. So something spoke to him a very deep primal part of him in these myths that was just he loved them, but his problem was that they're not they're not true, and and Tolkien's one of Tolkien's responses well you know. Why are they not true? Just because they maybe some of these things didn't happen in that way doesn't make them yeah. not true in a in a different sense. And of course, I think as Lewis uh, displays in his other other works, especially his nonfiction or apologetic works, is that you know we all have stories of how we got here, right? Everyone has a story that they tell. The question is, is that is that story true or not? And as as Christians, you know, we our story is often dismissed as being, you know, oh, that's just so fantastical or or silly yeah. or doesn't make any sense. And well, does it make more or less sense than the story that the evolutionists tell? I mean, right. I would argue not. <laughs> you right. know, that they're they're actually having a, a larger suspension of disbelief with their their evolutionary myth. Um, and I you know, I think you can call it a myth as well. You know, they have their own stories that they tell about the universe. And so, so it's, those it's, a, myths, it's like a, narr- a narrative framework, for, a narrative. Yeah. For uh, analyzing the data we all sort of see, would that be maybe a way of putting it? Like, yes, like the, le- yeah. the lenses I'm choosing to kind of view things through, Yeah. but, but it's not just subjective. Cause I think we're, we're saying here, like Lewis clearly is, is with the, the uh, affirmation of true myth. I mean, I think of, um, I mean, you can't miss his relationship with Tolkien, of course, in this being of the same, you know, cloth. But I love, I don't know if you if ever saw this, but somewhere along the line when the Lord of the Rings movies were really, you know, making all the, the headlines, in some interview with Viggo Mortensen, who played Aragorn in the movies, and I don't know much about his his personal sort of background and interest or involvement with any of this, but I thought his insight was profound in this because someone asked him, why are these stories so perennial of course talk about lord of the rings but you i think you could say this absolutely about all of of lewis's um fiction as well uh why are these why are these stories so perennial why are these so captivating to people all these years later and he didn't even just blink an eye as, as he said uh because they're true stories and it was it was, to me it's like that's exactly i think the, the idea like what what does he mean like because the interviewer wasn't expecting that you know and i think his sort of just painting it that bluntly as like this, you know, this isn't about elves and hobbits and yeah. this isn't about dwarves and, you know, um, the OER Sue and, and from, from the, the Ransom Trilogy perspective, Malel deal, like the, the specifics of it, it, it's basically dressed up in such a way that it's unfamiliar enough that it draws you in and it's interesting and then hits you in the face with yeah. just... Oh, I have to think about yeah. how I'm treating my family or I mean just yeah. these important things. So yeah. yeah. Well, and I think because we live in a world that is created by a personal God who is he's telling stories throughout history, you know, we and we live in that world and we can't escape it. And so there are these these elemental types that you see over and over again. And I think because they work because they are reflecting something that God is doing throughout human history, especially if you read your Bible. So if you read the Bible, you'll see, okay, what are things that come up again and again? Well, you know, youngest sons, like, you know, you tell a story, you're like, okay, once upon a time, there was a a castle on the sea and there were three sons. And like, who is the hero of that story? Well, you're like, well, it's going to be the youngest son. How do you know that? Well, yep stories right yeah. or you know I mean you just you have this sense or there's you know there was a, a king and queen and they had three beautiful daughters well who's going to be the most beautiful and the one that the story is about probably the youngest like why is that well because youngest sons comes up a lot or why second is there always sons, a priest or... prophet and king yes you know, exactly even, even in Star um, Trek you know <laughs> with you know, Kirk and Bones and McCoy like there's always this 
Yeah. You know, but yeah. And as you <laughs> study stories and you watch movies and you read good books and, you know, if you're, if you're reading intelligently, watching intelligently, this is why it can be annoying sometimes to watch a movie with a writer because they'll be like, oh, look, there was the, there was the second <laughs> act break. Uh, there was the, there was, you know, oh, that person's going to kill that person. <laughs> you're like, yep. how do you even know? Well, you got your popcorn. You're like, just stop. You. Just let me. Like, to, I you know. try not to do that, but there, there are times <laughs> and you're just like, oh, that was the good you know they, they they followed why are there those, those rules especially for movie making too yeah. you know, why do they have these formulas that actually work and if you break it it doesn't work or if you break right. you can break it in certain ways but there's rules for how you break it and ways to do it so that it works and yeah. and why is that well I think it's because we we live in a world that's created by an author and we mm -hmm. live in a story and there are there are there are rules that we don't even really sometimes are aware that they're there, but we just innately understand, oh, this is how stories work. You know, what, yeah. why do we love underdog stories? Why do we love stories yeah. where the hero is, you know, not this uh, burly, you know, <laughs> superhero sort, I mean, or even superhero stories, there's still something yeah. about those superheroes that's not, uh, that makes them not who you would expect, you know? Or so I think- some, There's some um, kind of vulnerability, there's some kind yeah. of- whether Relapse, that's internal you know, or, or right. you know, there's yeah. there's a struggle. We don't want to watch a movie about someone who just oh they're just excellent at everything and never have a bad day. <laughs> it's like oh, I no. think that's actually there's, I don't know if I'm remembering this correctly, but I, I think I heard somewhere that that's the reason that kryptonite was invented for the Superman story because <laughs> well but but I think it was something too like the original artist or whatever like someone had to go on vacation or there was some bizarre like completely not interesting thing where they needed to find a way to like you know, give themselves a break or take him out of the picture for a period of time. <laughs> so they're like, uh, I don't know, oh. irradiated chunks of his planet are somehow detrimental <laughs> to him. That sounds good. Because otherwise yeah. it's like, oh, hey, you know, I'm Superman. Like, okay. But um, yeah, yeah. Well, I, and it's funny because well, I'm thinking about like, um, I know this is so great because we're just jumping around, but I do have some questions for you at the end. I yeah, don't want to forget yeah. about the actual Ransom trilogy were for you. Mm -hmm. I always, whenever I'm interviewing someone on this topic, it's only been two or three times now, I like to ask them a couple of questions about, you know, I won't say what, because it'll give you too much heads okay. up. But, um, <laughs> but you, had, you had a line um, in there where you, you were talking about early on, I think this idea of outskirts of heaven, I think was the, was the, was the phrase. And so um, what do you think maybe just, um, and I think a lot, anyone watching this, they may not be familiar with the stories too much. So we, I guess we want to maybe try to avoid too heavy spoiler territory. Yeah. But again, if they're yeah. a long time listener to this show, I've basically hit on a lot of stuff just short of just giving the whole story anyway. So yeah. there's familiar vocabulary. They're like, wait, what Merlin's in it? Like, yes, <laughs> I've said that before, you know it. I won't say how maybe, but, um, but maybe just that, that I, with that idea, the outskirts of heaven, um, something I know, God rest his soul, he just died. I, I'm a, I love Tom Howard and some of his writings, his book. Um, did you ever read, um, oh my goodness, I just lost the name of it, Chance or the Dance by Tom Howard. Oh, that's, I have not. That was though, out of print if, for a while, but that sucker's yeah, powerful. That, it, it's, it's funny because I actually was at a book study where we were all supposed to bring like an excerpt of something to share. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the, the, one of the ladies there brought a big section from that book. And I, as I was listening, I was like, I'm going to put that on my reading list because that sounds like a good one. And he had, I, he wasn't friends with Lewis, but he had, when he was a young, I think, master's student studying English and stuff, he had some correspondence with C.S. Lewis himself mm -hmm. and stuff, which was cool. But but he just passed away. He was in his early 80s, I think, um, at the time of this recording, just a few months ago, maybe. But my only point is, he's got this, and it's a short little book, and I've, I've done a review of it before for everybody, but it's just, I love, how, it's very meandering on purpose, because it's trying to get at through, and one of his chapters is called Bravo the Humdrum, because this whole point is how this idea of what I think what, what you call outskirts of heaven, I think he has this phrase, this idea of just instance, like instances of something, you know, um, it's a very kind of, you know, um, I know for me from, from a, from a Catholic perspective, you know, we might use the word sacrament, but just some kind of, here's a thing, but it's not just this. It's, it's something God's given us to kind of direct us toward him, some sort of little, um, cue into a greater reality. So I don't know, maybe just a free for all for you, like on the ransom yeah. trilogy itself, like what, what are some of your favorite kind of instances or outskirts of heaven or, or Th themes even that, that Lewis really gets at in the books, you know? 
Yeah, well, I think um, kind of your note about, you know, looking at something and realizing that it's more than just the sum of its parts, right? Mm. Um, it's it's not just, you know, why, and, and I think those are the things that obviously most of us enjoy the most on a daily basis, you know, very simple, right. simple, just physical pleasures, right? Sitting down and eating breakfast with your family. Why, why is that? That's more than just sitting down and eating breakfast with your family, right? And I think yeah. um, I liked the, more than just the word. Yeah, the word sacrament, it's, it's true, you know, that that is, I think, eating meals with people is actually, mm -hmm. it's a sacramental sort of thing, um, mm -hmm. because it is more than just, yeah, feeding your body. And that's a, that is a theme that comes out, I think, throughout the Ransom Trilogy. Um, Lewis is fighting against a materialistic worldview, where it is just yeah. reducing everything down to atoms and what you can see and, and, you know, chemical reactions and that sort of thing. So, um, and realizing that, you know, the entire created world, especially as, you know, we believe that God created, created the heavens and the earth. And so when we look at it, we're looking at everything as a window, not a painting. So it's not a painting right. to just be looked at. It's actually a window to be looked through. Um, and right. that includes, I think that includes everything that God created and especially includes people, you know, people are created yeah. in his image and, um, have eternal souls. And so it just, it, and I think Lewis would agree that it just, it reshapes our entire, um, our entire world, really our interaction. And when we are with, with each other, when we are viewing it, um, in that way. So that comes yeah. out again and again. And I, I think it comes out particularly in that his strength. I love one of the things I love about that. He has strength is the, how the conflict and the juxtaposition between, the NICE and the, and St. Anne's, right? You have this yeah. kind of monolithic bureaucratic organization versus this like few men and women and a bear and Merlin. Right. And this, there's, they're very, they're, and they're in the kitchen making tea and, you know, the women yeah. cook and the men clean up and they take turns because they can't get along together and agree how to do things. And, you know, like, it's just very, you know, and you have the mice and yeah. Ransom calling the mice out and eating the crumbs off the floor. And it's just very, very yeah. simple in a lot of ways, uh, a simple group of people. And that's what their thing is. That is what they're trying to preserve ultimately. Is they're they're trying to preserve um that sort of way of living we just you know serve god and live quiet peaceful lives and enjoy each other and enjoy the good gifts that he has given us and i love that that lewis really highlights that he's great at drawing out that that's kind of the simple the simple pleasures you know the things i remember yeah. as a kid the things i loved about narnia you know, it was funny most of what i remembered about i loved about narnia were the times when they would be like eating an english breakfast <laughs> Yeah. So I always remember the scene when Shasta wakes up in Horse and His Boy in the dwarfs yes. and they eat like mushrooms, a big, huge plate of mushrooms and eggs and the sausages <laughs> that got a little burnt on the ends. And like, that was my favorite scene. Yes. Like, why, why do I love that scene so much? And obviously he's also writing it from the perspective of this boy who's never seen an English breakfast before. Right. And so it's just so magical to him. But this way that Lewis has of capturing again, the, the kind of the sacramental nature of creation and those simple, simple things. And that that is what we are trying. To, that's what we're fighting for. That's what we're trying to preserve. You know, so, so that's one of my too, favorite things. That's, and it's so funny because that just reminded me of, um, and not a lot of people know this, that Lewis himself uh, struggled with his personal kind of like uh, rapport, like with kids, like he wasn't really comfortable around children. <laughs> and what was funny was like, he, he worked on that because I think he said, he said a couple places, but one place in particular, I remember reading where he basically was like, I'm not really good with kids, but I know I should be. Like he had this sense of, yeah, like, yeah. it's not, you know, I, I, you know, you can't just oh, do kids, you know? So he, it's, a, it's a lot of respect that he worked on that. And especially when he's one of the most you know, iconic children's authors of all time. But, but what I love about it is to his credit that he really, I think, even if he wasn't, you know, he didn't think he was really good around kids or didn't really kind of connect with them sometimes. In so many ways, I think he did so profoundly. When, and one that jumps to mind, I forget which one of the Narnia books it is, but they're talking about the big table spread. And he says something about, uh, it had this and that and white wine. And he says, white wine, like, and then parentheses, which is what, which is what grownups call wine that is in fact yellow. 
<laughs> and then he just keeps moving on. And I just, I, every time I read that, I laugh so hard because I'm like, way to just throw in a random life observation. Like, why is white wine called? It's not white. It's, it's that's yeah. dumb. <laughs> but like for, from like a kid's perspective, you know, or like the thing like red onions, they're purple. Why, why am I calling yeah. them red? But it's, yeah. it's so on, on the surface of it, I can imagine, like, I can't, I can't imagine him in faculty meetings at Oxford. You know what I mean? Like just, I mean, talk about someone who intellectually belongs there more than most people in that room, but in another way is from another world. You know, yeah, I, I just yeah. can't imagine that, you know, I mean, as teachers, we've been in faculty meetings and it's just, can you imagine him with like that kind of stereotypical, like that, you know, like the, the Oxford kind of the dons and, and just like, yeah. Which you is know, why he, I think he actually, <laughs> they didn't actually really approve of his Narnia books. No, <laughs> they got a really, they kind of pretended they weren't like, weren't a thing, just and I love, fresh I love over them. He, I love why he shares in the preface, I think, to that hideous strength that he's, he didn't pick as sort of the, the setting for so much of, of the, the, the plot of that book, an academic setting, because he thinks that that's a better one than any other setting. It's the one that he just frankly says he's sufficiently the only one he sufficiently knows well enough to write on. Yeah, it. yeah. But I'm familiar because of with that. I love how you know you see the whole variety of the different characters and that hideous strength. Which, by the way, I, I I think a lot of people struggle with that one because it's so different in many ways from the first two. That now you get to this book and you're like, where's the space adventure? Where's the so like even if you have gone through the first two and you love them and everything, I remember when I first read that hideous strength, it did take me a while to really appreciate it. But now. I love it as much as the other two. Although yeah. I do have to, I, if I have to pick one, Peril Andrew is my favorite. That's, so. uh, that is the one, well, that's the one that Lewis thought was his best. He thought okay. Peril Andrew was the best. Though I think he still said that his strength was his personal favorite, but he thought Peril Andrew was the, the best work. I always well, have a hard time picking a favorite, honestly, yeah. but Peril, but Peril Andrew, Peril Andrew does have a, a special place yeah. to me. I, I quite, I quite enjoy that one. So. Well, do you know in, in this, uh, not yeah. to go too far into the weeds, because we don't, oh, how are we doing here? Well, we have a couple more minutes, if that's, if that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Because I want to ask, like, do you, so I was just checking dates here, because I know he wrote that, uh, The Abolition of Man in 1943. And then it, I think he published that hideous strength in 45, I want to say it was right, ne right around that's the end of the war, but it takes yeah. place in the near distant future after the war, close enough that, you know, it's not like, you know, jumping like, um, 1984 or or brave new world mm -hmm. or something way into you know the future it's close and there's a yeah. lot of things we don't have time to get into but there's of course a lot of things in that hideous strength that are very close to home even now you know of course just in our in our world in so many ways but do you know like just basically like how, was that i don't know if you know this or not but but when he's writing that hideous or um the abolition of man is do we know if he's like at the time thinking I need to this is the way I'm taking you know the third book of of like I, I'm I, just wondering how much time frame I there was like did he know where so. he wanted it to go or you know. I don't I don't think so necessarily for one okay. thing Lewis generally was not as organized <laughs> and as much of a planner <laughs> which which is yeah. one thing that I think drove drove Tolkien a little bit nuts because I can Tolkien yeah. was very much a planner right. um very much maybe a little bit too much um and Lewis was a lot more of um you know he was a genius but he was definitely a lot less strict and structured well, absent minded and professor sometimes a little bit sure. more that way <laughs> yes personality wise and so yeah. um I think, and again, I would have to dig a little more yeah. uh, more into this because I didn't do as much re background research on Abolition of Man just for time's sake. Um, right, but right. he was, it is pretty clear that he is writing that um, to address a particular issue that had come up with um, with education primarily right. um, at that time in a particular thing theme that he saw coming up again and again the trajectory of an actual issue in the society that he was addressing and i would imagine that it kind of it, he didn't necessarily plan on the the space trilogy going that direction but it kind of sure. just happened a little more organically yeah. um and he and it, and it works it makes sense yeah. um and that his strength too he he wrote that after he became good friends with uh, charles williams which also oh, yeah, affected right. his uh the whole merlin arthurian yes, uh that, okay. stripe that comes out in that his strength which really doesn't 
show up in the first two books really at all. Right. Um, maybe a, a, a little bit at the end of Paralandra, but it's really yeah. not present. And then that his strength, you're like, all of a sudden we are dealing with Arthurian myth and legend. What happened? Which is you so know, cool. What came out there, <laughs> which it works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It does work. But it was one thing that, that Tolkien didn't like. Uh, is that, is, yeah. um, he was a little bit of a little bit of a humbug about some of, some of Lewis's well, that's, uh, I love writings, to imagine those things but... too, like those inklings, like how, how do you like, <laughs> how do you like lovingly in, in a very English style, just bash Tolkien? Well, <laughs> that, and, and I, and there was something that uh, Tom Howard, funny enough, mentioned in a letter that, that Lewis had written to him when he was a young man, um, advising him to read the, the newly published works of professor Tolkien. But in the same sentence, he goes, you know, but the first, you know, the first 70 pages are just, you know, but like he just, that whole <laughs> building, the whole world building of the Shire and the birthday party and everything like Lewis is like, get on with it yeah. <laughs> so, so that's so funny I never heard uh, you know, to, to hear yeah. both of them coming no, at they, each other and they <laughs> and I think you know so I actually had a question someone asked me a question recently about you know why do you think their friendship kind of you know it did cool over time it yeah. you know didn't it, it was a really strong friendship first but it, it did kind of cool over time and I think a big part of it is personality they they kind mm -hmm. of they naturally had very very different personalities and and that they had a lot of a lot of clashes though I think they both made each other better which good friendships should do um, iron in, sharpens you know, iron <laughs> exactly exactly and so yeah. it, is, it is funny though to see what they had to say about each other's writings and I think um so so Tolkien wasn't a big fan of the Arthurian side of things that Lewis okay. probably partly because it wasn't well researched Lewis just kind of made things up you know he just he would just <laughs> and take Tolkien what he liked known that. yeah he just take <laughs> things he liked and that he'd heard and kind of wove together his own sure. sort of version of the Arthurian myth and you know that would have just driven Tolkien nuts like he's like I, you can't I do asked, that there's rules right, for this sort right of thing. after I was reading your book and my recent read through the the um uh, the Ransom trilogy, I asked a good friend of mine who's a super, like, just literature, you know, expert and guru, and he's, he's from England, which there's an added level of interestingness and all of that, because I asked him, I said, where, is, and actually, I turned him on to your book, by the way, and he was very thankful he hadn't heard of it yet, because he's thinking of writing on some, some of the similar subjects, too, someday, so uh, he might, he might contact you, I don't know, but he said, uh, I, I said, where does the, I, I want to do some more Arthurian legend reading, because I haven't done it in a while, I said, where, where's Lewis getting this stuff from? It's like how I phrased it. And his, his email back was so funny. And he's just like, it's complicated. <laughs> and it was how he started. And I was like, oh, yeah. He okay. pretty much got it, was, it from everywhere. I mean, right, that's just, what he he's was saying, one of yeah. those. And, and he had a, <laughs> I mean, he had an excellent memory. He, it, uh, there yeah. was actually, mm -hmm. there's these stories about games that his students would play with him. So when they, when he'd have them over, you know, for you yeah. know, study or, or just talk. And he'd have one of them go into his study and grab a book, random book off his shelf, open to a random place, random page, read a sentence. And Lewis would be able to tell him first off what book it was from. Oh, and he'd on. be able to recite the line before it and the line after it. And, that's like the, and that's they like the would, stuff you hear I mean, about he just the, had- uh, That's like the stuff you hear about the, the training for some of the rabbis and stuff where you have to like, you <laughs> stick the pin down through the scroll and yeah. they tell you every and Hebrew letter. Like which letter? Yeah, it he oh had so he God. had an excellent, excellent memory, which I think led leads to some of that lack of research, which I think actually works in his fiction, right? Where he's just writing and he probably didn't go and look up a bunch of Arthurian legends. He just wrote what he knew what he and kind of yeah. and made stuff up. Um, and one had of the things he to loved trust about what he knew. yeah, <laughs> yeah. One of the things he loved about Merlin, he even says this in, um, I think in the discarded image where he says the great thing about Merlin is that we don't know a lot about him. There's not a lot written about him. And so basically authors have free reign. They can take right. him and they can do what they want with him. And he's, but he is such a iconic and iconic legendary character. There's this weight yeah. and gravitas to him as a, as a character that you can take that and still have that, but then kind of do what you want with his backstory right. and his character. Um, so he loved that about Merlin, which is, I think one of the well, reasons he threw him in and there. Such, such a such a cool thing that you know for those who haven't read or haven't read it in a while or want to go deeper on it just his role in the third book of, of being this very fascinating 
not hybrid, but but kind of, you know, he, he's like this overlap of these two very different, like this very, you know, uh, pagan tapped into the forces of nature, kind of magical, mystical, but also like, Christian and kind of coming out of that and how even you could say, you know, God reaching him through what he's familiar with to draw him somewhere else, which is hilarious because not hilarious. It's fascinating because that's exactly where we all are in a way, right? Yeah, you know, like, yeah. and the, the whole endeavor that he's setting out to achieve maybe through these books of like, you know, maybe you're not Merlin, but you're somewhere where God comes to meet you. This is what I always tell my students. I push back quite a bit, you know, the, 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 typical way the whole Jesus loves you just the way you are. Yes, but he loves you way too much to just leave you there, you yes. know? And so that's yeah. what we're always like. It's, it's Christ never once just meets someone where they're at and just stays there. It's like, no, it's follow yeah. me, <laughs> go and yeah. sin no more. Like there's, there's always a, you can't stay. None of us can stay as we are. And obviously that theme's all over the place, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's great. Can I just, uh, we're, we're coming up on our, unfortunately, we're going to have to close this chapter a little bit, but I'm absolutely, I'm, I'm not yeah. kidding. I wrote down like, till we have faces interview, <laughs> like I'll, I'll definitely be keeping in touch with you and having you back if yeah. you're interested for sure. Yeah, that'd be um, great. And I will, I, I always do the uh, intro and outros and stuff later. So I okay. will have for everybody, I don't know why I'm saying it now, but hey, everybody <laughs> at the beginning, which you already heard or which you'll hear in a second, I'll remind you of all the links and everything too here. But uh, just a couple quick closing questions for you. Yeah. So Deeper Heaven, uh, well, Ransom Trilogy, all three books, Out of the Silent Planet, Paralandra, or That Hideous Strength, they're all three. Who's your favorite character? Ooh, that is a hard one. That's See, a hard one. Because I mean, it's one of those where you kind of feel like, well, you know, it, it's like your favorite character in the Bible. And a lot of people will say, well, I have to say Jesus because, you know, mm -hmm. and so it's like, well, but that's not really what they mean. You know, it's like, Jesus <laughs> is a given. So it's kind of, for me, it's like, well, ransom is a given. I That's think true. You know, he, I, I, the more I study um, him as a character, his story arc, I think the whole trilogy, yeah, the way he grows. I mean, I think it's shaped around him as a character and how his role that he has in each of the books. So that's, right. but that's kind of the cop-out answer. Like, oh, right. I was going to say, now you're um, just stalling. No. <laughs> I know. Um, but I actually, I really do love, um, Mr. Dr. Dimble in that he is strange. Yeah. He is honestly one of, one of my favorite characters. I think yeah. um, he's hilarious for one thing. He and his wife together are hilarious. Yeah. Um, they're great. Cause you know, she just, she kind of knows him and she'll just be like, you know, listening to him ramble on and on and is very patient. And, and, but he, um, he's just a great character. I think, cause he, um, he has a lot of wisdom and insight and yet the way he's, the way he talks and the way he interacts with the other characters. I've, I've always yeah. had, had a, a fondness for Dr. Dimple. Yeah. So my, mine's yeah, probably a tie between Mr. Bultitude and uh, oh, yes. McPhee. I just love the like McPhee. McPhee I, is I, great too. <laughs> I love, and especially the audio, the one audiobook I listen to, they really get his accent, which, you know, they, they specify in the book that people think it's a Scottish accent, but it's actually like a, like a Northern Irish kind of accent, mm. you know, they, which is funny because like, I, that's clearly, I don't know that Lewis is, I've heard recordings of him, but he didn't have a thick sort of accent that most of, I think Americans would detect, but he of course himself yeah. was, was from, you know, Northern Ireland, yeah. but, um, but uh, so yeah, Mr. Bultitude or McPhee, I just love the idea of a resident, like a, a duly designated skeptic. Like yeah. you have to have one around just to, and he's so like every line and like they're going up against the forces of evil and all this. And he's like, well, maybe it's this. It's like, dude, just so, but, uh, and then the, the two more quick for you. Who's your, this is tricky, least favorite character. Ooh. Oh, that is tricky. <laughs> and again, you could ever... say the bent, the bent one, but well, okay. Yeah. You know, obviously the bent, the bad one. guys. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, I think so that's hard because yeah least favorite because obviously a lot of times I read as a writer which means even yeah. the bad characters like they're just so well written they're like oh well, exactly great um yeah, but yeah. I would probably say oh the <laughs> I'm gonna blank out on the name um I think it's Philostrato Philostrato yeah. oh, in man, that he's strength he just kind of he's kinda so creepy gives, <laughs> he is very creepy so I'd probably have to say he's the one that pops out as far as yep and yeah, when he so really like, gets like more and more just bizarre with the whole like sanitation and aluminum trees and you're like, oh, okay, dude, yeah. like, yeah, weird. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then the, the, the last one for you, just any, any kind of, you know, favorite takeaways maybe from 
you know, just deeper heaven, you know, as, as a, you know, your book, Lewis's concept of it, just, you know, maybe if, if you know, a closing thought for anyone, uh, maybe someone who hasn't really read them before or hasn't read them in a while or wants, wants to revisit them and, and go deeper, just yeah. any kind of last word of encouragement yeah. maybe for anyone. Well, I think um, the series as a whole, and in particular that he is strength is I think very, very applicable to the times that we live in, which is one of the reasons why there are such great books is, um, you know, Lewis wrote them 50 plus years ago now. And yet there's, you know, there's a lot of things coming out where you're like, that sounds very prophetic. So just from mm. a, from an application standpoint, um, I've seen people discover just discovering them recently or rereading them. And continually the theme that comes out is it's like he knew what was coming. It's like he saw yeah. what was coming. And I would say, well, in a way that's because he did, it was already happening in his own right. time, but he saw, he's very, very smart and he, and intelligent. And he also sees how people work. That's the biggest, I think Lewis's biggest strength is he understands people, their strengths, mm. their weaknesses, their temptations, how they actually work. And so he can look yeah. at something and say, this is, if this doesn't, God doesn't intervene. This is how things go. This is how people interact. This is how right. nations work, civilizations. And so this is where we're headed. And so I think just from, from, you know, the time that we live in very, very interesting times, you know, the, the, the time is, I think it's a Chinese curse, right? I mean, you live in interesting times. It's like, well, right. yes, we definitely, <laughs> definitely do that. Um, and I think, so I think books like that by men who are very insightful and, and see, um, where things are headed. I think it's just important that we read those. Um, and in addition, just they're great fun. They're well-written. Um, and as the, as you see the themes and the, uh, the different things that Lewis was trying to do with these books, I think you understand how they hold together and how they're really uh, quite brilliant and, and just, and just great fun. So obviously, you know, I'm yeah. a big fan. I wrote a book about them. That's so right. <laughs> I definitely think people should read them. And I think there's a lot, especially the worldviews that come out with um, Weston and the NICE in the last mm -hmm. book, that these are, these are worldviews that were a problem. We're, we're coming out in Lewis's day. And I think we're seeing the downstream fruit of that. Absolutely. And so um, to understand that is, is really important. So yeah. Uh, yeah, that I think, I think people should read them. And if they're, they do read them and they're confused, then they can read my book. <laughs> Absolutely. And like I said, you'll have all the links and everything for everyone. So you know, Christiana yeah. Hill, thank you so much. Uh, we will definitely have you back on again. Cause I've, uh, we're just getting started. I think. Yeah, this is great fun. Thank you so much. I love yeah. talking about this stuff. So, Oh my gosh, that was so much fun. Um, truly, truly just awesome conversation. I cannot wait to have many more conversations with her on all sorts of things. Lewis literature, life. Uh, Lewis Literature and Life. That might be a good title for something as well. So anyways, thank you guys so much for tuning in to the Gracious Guest Show today. As always, remember, subscribe. If you have not subscribed uh, on the YouTube channel, please do that. Click like. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, um, please write up a good review. If you guys could, could give us some good feedback, go to thegraciousguest.org, my website for everything right there at the top, the YouTube channel, the podcast, uh, teaching stuff that I'm doing over there, presentations, other links. I even blog once in a while. I haven't in a long time, but I will probably pretty soon. So everything's over there at thegraciousguest.org. Like, subscribe, follow, all that social media stuff really helps get the word out about the channel, helps boost the um, the sort of um, uh, visibility, you know, of people like Christiana, people like the great guests I have on here, helping their work get the appreciation it deserves. Um, and, and so if I can help, as I was uh, saying to her earlier, if I can help in any way to... to get uh, these these folks that are doing such wonderful work out there, I'm more than happy to do it. I'm blessed to do it. Thank you guys so much. God bless you. And until next time, don't forget to wonder. Take care. <laughs>